Uh, we're in a series called I Struggle With. And what we did is a couple months ago, we gave you guys a series of cards that had the phrase I Struggle With and let you fill in the blank. And out of that, we created an eight week series. And one of the topics that you guys wrote about was the idea of doubt and disbelief. So that's where we're at today. This should be really fun. But when I just immediately brought to mind, I was thinking, what was the time that I had this like absolute trust and faith in something? And I remember uh, when I was about eight, nine, is when I at least remember hearing the concept that God answers prayers for the first time, or at least understanding what that meant. And as an eight-year-old, of course, I was super selfless with that newfound power and decided to pray that God would give me a Nintendo. <laughs> It was very necessary. You definitely need it. And so I prayed that, and of course, I woke up the next morning, and at the foot of my bed, there was not a Nintendo waiting for me. However, I, I, I had, uh, it was eight, so I have a hard time remembering the exact details, but I believe it was about a month later, my sister comes back from riding her bike down the road. And just so you know, we live in the middle of nowhere. Uh, if, the, if the corn is up, you can see maybe two houses from our house. You know, we're on a dirt road. Not a whole lot of traffic, not a whole lot around. She comes home and she says, there's a Nintendo NES in a ditch by our house. <laughs> and sure enough, we go down there. There's a Nintendo NES. There are controllers and a game. And we take it home, we plug it in, and it works. <laughs> and as a kid, that's all you need to be like, God is real. <laughs> he answered my prayer. And when you are a kid, that really is all you need. I mean, you can tell something by an adult or even a friend, and you can take it for it's 100% accurate all the time. And that's kind of the whole aspect of growing up, is you realize through experiences or through talking or through sometimes pain or good stuff that some things that you said as black and white are not true all the time. So some things that you take for granted or some things you believe in you find out don't quite work that way. And when it comes to the concept of God, when it comes to the concept of faith and Christianity, you start realizing that some things that were really easy to believe when you were younger, start getting a little harder. Some big questions start coming your way that there doesn't seem to be a really good answer for. And maybe somebody proposes to you one day this idea that you've never thought about, and all of a sudden you have one of those aha moments where it's not a positive one, where you're like, oh, whoa, I never thought about that. And so when it comes to the concept of doubt, we have to tackle a couple things today. We have to tackle about what are those questions. We also have to tackle what would we do with that feeling. But I want to kind of settle with, what are some of the big questions that people have about Christianity? And each one of these questions is its own sermon. So I apologize today we can't give, you know, half hour to each topic because you don't want that either. <laughs> but they're big questions, but we need to discuss them a little bit. So they go as follows. The first one is this. The Bible portrays God as violent, reactive, vengeful, bloodthirsty, immoral, mean, and petty. Second one, the Bible and science collide on too many things to think that the Bible has anything to say to us today about the big questions of life. Number three, in the face of injustice and heinous suffering in the world, God seems disinterested or perhaps unable to do anything about it. Number four, in our ever-shrinking world, it is very difficult to hold on to any notion that Christianity is the only path to God. And number five, Christians treat each other so badly in such harmful ways that it calls into question the validity of Christianity or even whether God exists. That's, they're big, aren't they? <laughs> they can be really encapsulated in two ways. First way to encapsulate it is I have a problem because the Bible says so. Second one is I have a problem because my experiences tell me so. And with that, we struggle with, I mean, those are big questions. We struggle with that. And those are big questions that can cause a lot of doubt, and a lot of doubt right up front. But the cool thing is, is we're not the first person, we're not the first people to ever have those questions, or at least have that experience of doubt. Have you ever been to church on Easter before? You may have heard at one point a story about a certain disciple named Thomas after the resurrection of Jesus Christ who experienced a very similar feeling that we can experience when it comes to doubt. So a disciple of Jesus named John wrote about after the resurrection, Jesus appeared to 10 of the 11 remaining disciples. And they're all excited, and they're all firm, and they're like, yeah, Jesus is back, he's real, he's resurrected, all this stuff. But one disciple wasn't there, and it was Thomas. 
And so when Thomas gets back and Jesus is gone, the disciples are all excited and they're like, hey, he's back. And Thomas probably did what most of us would have done and said, uh, I don't think so. And he even says, I won't believe until I'm able to physically touch the wounds that Jesus had on the cross. You know, what's super cool about the story is we call him Doubting Thomas, even though the Bible never says that. We give him that name, which I think displays our attitude towards doubt sometimes. But what's cool about that is Jesus did not say, oh, well, since you did not believe, I'm not appearing to you. Since you didn't believe, you are somehow less of a disciple now. Because you didn't believe, you are somehow punished. No, Jesus reappeared. And instead of reappearing with this opening petty phrase, he says, instead, peace be with you. And then even goes to Thomas and says, touch the wounds in my side and believe. Which is really fun because he meets Thomas where he's at in his doubt. What's also cool is in the Old Testament, there's a book called Psalms. There's 150 songs in there. They vary in topic and form, but there's one of them. Psalm 88 that we're going to look at today, which I'm just going to warn you right now, is not a very positive one. It's a little more, uh, at least more realistic sometimes about what we feel. And it starts like this. O oh Lord, God of my salvation, I cry out to you by day. I come to you at night. Now hear my prayer and listen to my cry. For my life is full of troubles, and death draws near. I am as good as dead, like a strong man with no strength left. They have left me among the dead, and I like a corpse in the grave. Moving on to verse 11. Can those in the grave declare your unfailing love? Can they proclaim your faithfulness in the place of destruction? Can the darkness speak of your wonderful deeds? Can anyone in the land of forgetfulness talk about your righteousness? And then it ends with this very encouraging phrase. Darkness is my closest friend. <laughs> now, I read that today to say this. Do you hear that mocking tone in there? Can those in the grave give you praise? Are the promises that you said you'd take care of us true to those who are not experiencing it? Are you faithful at all the time? I'm experiencing suffering. I'm experiencing pain. Where are you, God? And there are entire books of the Bible devoted to that whole concept. You might run to read Ecclesiastes and get depressed. It's pretty much that entire concept of life is meaningless. There is pain. There is suffering. What is the point? And I say that not to put us into a staring, discouraging mode today, but to simply say that God is not afraid of our doubt. He is not somehow ashamed of it. He is not somehow punishing it. He instead, he welcomes it. He welcomes the raw, real emotions that you and I experience often when it comes to life. When we look at how things are going, we look at how these experiences are, and we hear about how these things should be, how God is, and then we see how they are, and they don't seem to line up, and we have this inner frustration. God is not afraid of that, and God instead welcomes that. And so we end with this night. We continue on with this idea that there's no shame in doubt. Instead, that doubt is a journey. And where doubt leads us at times is not always where we want it to lead. To give you a little context on this, Sometimes the church collectively has been afraid of doubt, has been afraid of questions. Not all of us, but sometimes collectively we have been. And part of that stems from the 19th century is when the first time the church kind of experienced for the first time on a social academic scale big questions attacking its validity, big questions attacking its source, especially the Bible at that time. And since that time, this idea of defending the faith has been paramount in the focus of Christianity, especially when it comes to the materials it produces. The sermons, the songs, the movies, the Bible studies, the small groups, the curriculum, a lot of it deals with the topic of defending the faith, saying what I believe is not crazy, what I believe has validity and real application in this world. And there's been some really, really great things that have come from that. What was really interesting is when you overemphasize that, you come to this conclusion that my faith is correct thinking, that my faith is believing the right things. You've probably heard the phrase, you've been around the church at all, know what you believe and why you believe it. Have your ducks in a row, <coughs> where you need to know what your beliefs are about all things. And we have sometimes overemphasized that and created that into our faith, that our faith in God is simply believing the right things. And what is interesting is there's some symptoms that come along the way when we do that. And maybe you will recognize these symptoms. I borrowed this, by the way. This is not my idea. I borrowed this from a book called The Sin of Certainty. 
And the author displays these four symptoms of when we function under a faith that believes faith is correct thinking. The first one is unwavering dogmatic certainty. Vigilant monitoring of who's in and who's out. Preoccupation with winning debates and defending the faith. And this is the one I struggle with the most, conforming unquestionably to intellectual authorities and celebrities. What this is spelling out is the difference between religion and relationship. Religion is very, very focused on making sure we believe the right things. And making sure the people around us believe the same things we believe. You know, we'll talk about a symptom of this, denominations. There's some great things to that, but there's a gazillion different denominations. And on paper, most of them are 99% identical. And that is not an exaggeration. On paper, they are pretty much the same in function and belief. But because there might be a 1% to 2% difference, we say you can sit here and you can form a different church down the street. Because when you are under an idea of religion, that faith is correct thinking, you have to be with a group of people that are like you. There's that vigilant monitoring of who's in and who's out. That unwavering, unquestionably adhering to some authority or figure that speaks a certain doctrine or belief system that we're all going to follow to the end. Another symptom of this is also that whole phenomenon of saying you vote this way and there's, you cannot vote that way. If you vote this way, you're a Christian. If you don't vote this way, you're not. Which is ridiculous. That is religion. And when it comes to doubt, if that is how your faith functions, doubt becomes the worst enemy. Because anything that throws into question your faith now throws into question your entire belief system. And it feels like an attack. It feels like something that is getting to the core of who you are instead of potentially being a journey that God has purposely leading you on. Because faith is not just rational thought. Now, hear me out. There's a part of faith that's definitely correct thinking, believing. But faith is not just that. Faith is, is rational thought, but faith is also trust. Amen. And doubt is going to lead you to a place that's oftentimes very uncomfortable. Doubt sometimes is not going to lead us to a rational, correct answer. Sometimes doubt is going to lead us to a place where we have to trust. And that's all that we have in that moment. And that is not a cop-out. Now, I'm not going to apply that cop-out and say, therefore, we don't have to worry about these questions. That, that's a little being irresponsible. But we know that's true, and we know that that's functionally true as well. Because the Apostle Paul, when he describes our relationship with God, what illustration does he use? He uses the illustration of marriage. That illustration is used often. And in a marriage relationship, or in any relationship, if all it is is a factual knowledge of the individual, you know what it's called? Stalking. <laughs> That's all that is. <laughs> if all I know are facts about you, we don't have a relationship. We do not have a relationship. And when a relationship in marriage, a, relationship, a marriage relationship that does not have trust in it, will function in probably one of two ways. One, it'll become incredibly apathetic. And people will be withdrawn and distant because at that space, they cannot be hurt. Or they'll become incredibly controlling and fearful because there's no trust. Trust is the foundation of a relationship. Mutual trust is the foundation of a relationship. And it is no different than our relationship with Jesus Christ. And when, that is, when we understand that aspect, that there's things we don't know, things we don't understand, things we have to trust, the battle between each other, that religious mentality starts dying pretty quickly because we have the humility to realize we don't know all things. And so, functionally, getting back to those big questions we brought up earlier, because we have to address them. They're big questions. We keep in mind that when we approach some of these harder things, that trust is going to be part of the equation. There are some rational answers to a lot of these things, which is awesome. But trust is going to be part of the equation. And also, before we get to these questions, because they're big ones, you know, it's pretty much the problem of science and violence, of evil, of exclusiveness, and my experience with Christians summed up in the problem with the Bible, my problem with experiences. But before we answer those questions, we have to understand that actually the foundation of Christianity is not found in any of those. Which is interesting, because when you want to attack an idea, when you want to attack an ideology, you have to look at the foundation of belief and where it's coming from. The foundation of belief of where we're coming from is in Jesus Christ. It's in the event of the resurrection. 
Without that, that's all pointless. It's all worthless. There's nothing. We have zero about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we have to start with answering that. And if you're somebody here today who's a skeptic, and I've been there, who is like, I don't know if I believe in all this, you have to start here first. Because if we're going to start here, we can talk about a few different things that are really fun. We can talk about the historical aspect of the resurrection. We can talk about the weird events surrounding all of this. The idea that Jesus who came from a backwater, conquered, impoverished country, who was constantly rebelling, had constant rebellions all the time, whose leaders who were rebelling were constantly being executed, from that country, from a position where Jesus, according to the social appearance, looked like he was born illegitimately, wasn't, but it looked like that, started an incredible disadvantage, really on all practical terms, Beyond his miracles looks no different than any average person who's rising up and leading a rebellion against the Romans, which is what they thought he was going to do. That's what they wanted him to do. Got tried and executed, which was also not that big of a phenomenon. Nothing new, nothing different there. But from that circumstance, something radically happened that caused the greatest explosion of historical documents that we have ever seen for somebody, ever from that time period. And not just in the Hebrew language, multiple different languages. And that gospel message that got written down started doing something that had never done, been done before. Started transcending racial boundaries. Started transcending cultural boundaries, boundaries. Started becoming accepted by people who had nothing to do with Judaism. Nothing to do with the Jewish culture. Who, at that time, any other culture was seen as a threat. All of a sudden, they're accepting this person named Jesus into their life and experiencing transformation because of it. Not only that... People who killed Jesus, this is a fun fact, Pharisees who killed Jesus, many of them 15 years later were leaders in the church. What would it take for you to believe somebody was so horrible and so bad that you had to kill them? What would it take for you to be convinced, oops, I made a mistake, and end up following that person instead? What would it take for that? If you've ever read the Bible, you know their vehemence, their hatred was so strong for Jesus. What would it take to convince you that you were wrong? Then you have the brother of Jesus who didn't believe in Jesus as Lord and Savior until after the resurrection is now leading the church. What would it take for you, for your sibling to convince you that they were the Son of God? This is a fun thought. <laughs> <laughs> what would it take? There is so much. At the very least, if you're here today, I'm like, I don't believe that. You have to give a good answer for one of the strangest historical phenomenons we have ever known. Of why did this person who honestly <coughs> on all means and all significance did nothing really that exceptional outside of the resurrection created this immense explosion in history? And I believe it's because he was resurrected from the dead. Because if somebody predicts their own death and when they're going to rise again and does it, you know, maybe they're the son of God. <laughs> you know, it's just, that's just kind of where I'm left with. It's like, you know, if you can do that, man, all right. Tell me what to do next. But we have to start there, because that is where our faith is founded in. That, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, which is why every Easter, that's what we talk about. And so with that in mind, we can talk about these questions a little bit. And don't worry, I'm not going to give long responses like I did that one. But we can touch on these a little bit now. The violent, vengeful nature of God. Pretty much what we're talking about here is the Old Testament, which is the original Jewish scriptures that were made, or that we had, and then were kind of slapped with the New Testament, which were the stories of Jesus and the writings afterwards. There's a lot of violent moments that seem God-ordained and God-directed in the Old Testament that bother us a lot. And there are two things to keep in mind. They don't answer every scenario, because we can't take that time. I have to go to a book in my office that is 1,500 pages long that deals with every moment of violence in the Old Testament. That's called The Crucifixion of a Warrior God. Great book. Who else is going to read that? Probably not a whole lot of people. And so we have to understand some encapsulating ideas when it comes to the violence of God. One, we have to understand that the people that God is working with, one of the biggest narratives of the Old Testament, one of the biggest themes, is that God has worked with people where they're at. Even where the people are at is not pretty. And thank God for that. Because you and I are in the exact same place. God has worked with us from where we were at in the beginning, even with where we were at, was not good. And some of the people that he works with, some of the people that have belief systems and way to do things where they're at, was incredibly violent and not great. But we also have to understand that we're looking at this with our Western lenses. 
Lenses that don't understand a time of kill or be killed, a time of survival, a time of tribal warfare, a time of either be conquered, enslaved, or conquer and enslave. Where your culture was literally keep being on the edge of extinction at any time because of the attacking or robbing different groups of people that were all around you. If you ever read the Old Testament, there are just countless names of all of these tribes and people that were always at war seeking these violent actions. And in that time, we understand that for us, that seems so horrible. But for them, it was a culture that they were in. It was a time that they were in. I think keep in mind that we're not looking into yesterday. We're looking into thousands of years ago. Again, it doesn't answer every question, but I think it's a good encapsulation of a lot of the moments in the Old Testament that really bother us. The second one, the idea of science and Bible colliding. And here's just, again, I think where we can land on that as 95% of the time, it does not have to. Chase preached a really powerful good sermon uh, five months ago on the essentials and not essentials of the Christian faith. The essential of the Christian faith is Jesus Christ and the resurrection. Whether this moment in the Old Testament is literal or a narrative that's trying to prove a greater point becomes a non-essential opinion. Religion says that you and I have to agree on this completely. Faith and trust says maybe I don't know about everything and maybe this is not a worthy point of battling over. We have to have humility when we approach some of these ideas in the Old Testament that seems to really counter what we know about science. It's possible they're true, absolutely. It's also possible we're not. And does that destroy our faith? Absolutely not. Our faith is in Jesus Christ. Our faith is in the resurrection. And so in those moments when we're battling with people, feeling like science and the Bible has to collide, I do not think most of the time it has to. Clearly the resurrection aspect of it, yeah, we're going to collide there. But most of the time when we have made that happen in the church, historically, it does not have to. And with anything I say, by the way, like I am not at all so attached to things that I can't have coffee and talk about if anything bothers you that I say. Like I am always open to having a bunch of coffee all the time. And I'm not going to tell you you're wrong. I'm not going to tell you that your, your opinion is invalid. But understand that this is a little bit it's my opinion there as well. So coming over here with the experiences where is one question in here that's a little more easy to answer? The exclusiveness of God. You know, him claiming to be the only way, the truth, and the light. And here's the thing with that. If Jesus Christ is who he says he is, if he is God, he's the only one who has the right to make that claim, you know? And kind of a moot point a little bit. You know, the basis of that is that he's God, and he can make that claim, that I am the only way, and that I am the truth and the light. And if he isn't God, then that question is kind of thrown out. And so it kind of really rests on that. If he's God, he can make that claim. Now, the harder one of these questions, probably the second hardest question you could ever have about your faith is the idea of pain and suffering. Probably the strongest <coughs> argument against Christianity is being honest. It really is. It's, it's a really hard one. And here's the thing. Is there's good answers for it. There's not great answers. And that's where trust comes in heavily. Because, you know, if we look at the life of Jesus, we look at somebody who is clearly concerned with the poor, the suffering, the underprivileged, healing people who have experienced incredible maladies their entire life, really engaging with people that desperately needed people that culture thought were worthless. So clearly God has an attitude of intense caring and love for the broken and the suffering. That I think we can establish. But why do good things happen to bad people? Why did God let that happen? And I don't want to plaster over not only the pain of the world, but the pain that you have experienced personally, and just say, oh, you just need to trust. Because of that, oh man, I don't, want to, I don't want to do that to you. But I'm not going to lie to you and say that I have somehow this great encapsulating answer that solves that. For me, and maybe I'm just speaking for me, that is an area where I've got to trust that God knows what he's doing. That's an area where I've got to trust that I don't know all things I can't know all things but that God is good, God does care, and he is working for the good of all those who love him and are called according to his purpose. That was a hard question, and I'm not, again, like I said, I'm not going to cheapen it with an easy answer. And that's something that if you're struggling through, again, let's talk about that in person, because I want to work with that with you. And the last one, the last one, 
is actually really interesting. Uh, and I'm going to reread it to us real quick so we're reminded of what it is. Christians treat each other so badly and in such harmful ways that it calls into question the validity of Christianity or even whether God exists. Um, here's what's really cool about that one. That is the only one of the five questions that you and I can control. Hear that for a second. That is the only one of the five major doubts that people have in their faith with Christianity that you and I can control. Everything else is kind of a philosophical, metaphysical debate. But that is an experience that you and I can have direct input into. And this is something that if you've ever been part of, if you've ever experienced religion, if you were raised in some sort of religious household or religion, and you felt like you came to church and it didn't work out, and you tried that for a while, and you felt like it became, made people judgmental or just was empty, then you probably had an experience that was not positive. And it'd be really easy today to rest on that and just kind of give you the bad news and sell the negative. But what's interesting is that this experience experiences this is actually the most powerful question because why do people make the vast majority of the decisions they make? Because of their experiences. We like to think because we have this rational thought process, but the vast majority of the choices that you and I may make are made in the, in the realms of comfort and discomfort. What is familiar and what is unfamiliar. We make most of our decisions based off of our experiences. Which is awesome because most people will make the decisions about Jesus Christ based off of their experiences with another believer. One of the strongest testimonies. What does John say? Going back to him again. He says, the world will know who I am because of what? Because of the love that you have for each other. That is incredibly powerful and incredibly hopeful. Because again, like I said, we can control that. You and I can do something about that. And so, when I think about my own faith, when I think about the many times I have dealt with, I even go through this kind of mental exercise of like, oh, I have all these rational beliefs and why I believe this is happening, why I believe this makes sense, all this stuff. And you know, in the end, sometimes I'll get burned away and I still have doubts. And what I rest on is my experiences. The moments where I've seen myself or other people need provision, for example, financial provision, and then in the mail, through somebody, somehow, the exact amount shows up on time for what they need, and their need is met in the most miraculous circumstance possible. The moments when their needs were physical or emotional, and there did not seem to be hope, and there did not seem to be a solution, there did not seem to be healing, and yet God brings the transformation and healing that God can bring. And I see that life change in ways that don't make sense. When I've seen someone's life not just get enhanced by the gospel, get radically changed in 180 from one to another in ways that really don't make sense in any other way besides the power something outside of them working in their life. It's the experiences that I've had with you, with people who represent well the unconditional, uncompromising love of Christ and how they have shown that to me in my darkest times and how I've seen them show it to others in their darkest times. The moments when I've seen people pretty much sacrifice their livelihood, their home, their comfort for the needs of another person. It's my experiences that keep me here. Because I've had those moments of doubt, those moments where I try to rationalize through it, and sometimes it really just isn't enough. Sometimes there isn't a really great rational thought that somehow dissipates all the doubts that I'm experiencing. And then I end up reflecting upon what have I experienced, what have I seen, what have I noticed in how God moves? And I'm like, all right, yeah. This is worth it. This is moving. This is real. And with that element, and with that element, we have to kind of ask ourselves another final question. <coughs> when it comes to the idea of doubt and trust in our faith, all of us today have to ask the question, what are we trusting in? And is what we're trusting in working? Because that is the most significant foundational element of a relationship, of our lives. We're all trusting in something. We are all, as some people say, we're all worshiping something. And so is what we are trusting in working? Is it in Jesus Christ, the power of Jesus Christ, something outside of ourselves, something more powerful than ourselves? Or is it in our own abilities? Is it in somebody that we're following? Is it in our future plan? Is it in our success? Is it in our abilities, our skills, 
Is it in our work? Is it in our family? Is it in whatever fill in the blank? Where is our trust actually at? And one good way to reveal that is where are you afraid of losing the most? Usually reveals where our worship, where our trust really is. Where the center of our faith really is. And I want to give us a possible solution today. That maybe you've been tired out by religion. Maybe you've experienced the faith where all you do is feel like you have the right beliefs. And you've gotten sick of getting into the debates. You've gotten sick of trying to be afraid of the next doubt that could come your way. Or the next thing you hear on the news. Or the next idea that you feel like counters Christianity. Maybe you're tired of living in that fear, that mode of having to protect and box in what you believe so that you feel protected. Maybe you've just gotten worn out by that. And you see how it's turning into you into the wrong person. It's either pushing you away to the point where you're losing your faith, or it's pushing you to a place where you're becoming incredibly critical and judgmental. Maybe it's time for us to actually engage in the relational nature of God and trust in Him. Perhaps you are in a position where life is just not working out. Where you have these plans, you have these goals, you've never tried religion, you've never tried Christianity, but you're here today and you just know that something's wrong, something's missing, something's not right. And what I'm not offering is a solution to all things. I'd like tomorrow you're going to get a million dollars and that's all going to be great. What I'm offering is something core, deep within you, that you desperately need and you know you need, and that is the saving power of Jesus Christ. That as you know, you look at the brokenness in your life and you know that this is beyond you. Look at the brokenness of others and you know this is beyond you. And you know that you need to trust in something bigger and better and stronger than you could possibly imagine. And I'm going to give you the opportunity today to say that, that maybe that is Jesus Christ. And for those of us who feel like we're in the position of following Jesus and we just know we need to get reminded of those trust, you know what happens when you trust somebody? You submit to them. Mutual trust is mutual submission. Maybe God has been telling you to do something, be part of something, say something for a long time, and you've been really afraid of it, or you've been avoiding it, or you're afraid of praying and talking to God for more than five minutes because you know it's going to come up. Part of trust in Jesus is us submitting to Him, us submitting our lives, our choices, our fears, our beliefs, even, to Him. It is incredibly hard, but incredibly rewarding. And it's interesting. I say it's incredibly hard, but really, sometimes it's just hard for us to get to the point where we finally say, okay, I'm going to do this. I will submit to you. And hold on. When you submit to Jesus, He does not go halfway. He has an amazing purpose and will and plan for your life. He said that from the beginning. We want to believe that. We like saying that. We like hearing that until the purpose and will is uncomfortable. And even for us today, we just need to be reminded of submitting back to where he led us to originally. And so again, like all things, if you want to have a kind of conversation, I, this is my job. So you're not going to bother me. I would love to. Always. We're going to pray. We're going to worship after be dismissed. Let's bow our heads real quick. Lord, I thank you so much that you are not a God who's afraid of doubt or somehow scared by that. That we don't have to be ashamed that we have moments where we have deep questions that don't seem to have great answers. Lord, I pray when we have doubts and questions that the times where we can't have rational, concrete answers, that they come our way. And we can feel security in that and understand that that is awesome. But in the moments where all we are left is with is having to trust, I pray that we submit to that as well and feel your grace and security in a way that we had not felt before. Lord, as we cast aside the idea of just being religious but actually having a relationship, I pray that you reveal in our hearts the little religious strongholds that we have and are able to cast those out so we can experience freedom in you. When you said you want to give us life and life to the fullest. Lord, I pray that we're in a position today where this is something new, this is something foreign. <coughs> that you are speaking clarity through my words. That you're speaking clarity into our hearts about what is next. About what we have to do to have a relationship with you. And I pray that it's something today that we know we have to do 
that we're afraid to do, that we have the courage and the encouragement from others to do what you're leading us towards. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for your Holy Spirit being present today. May all things be glory to you. In Jesus' name.